I said, no, wait a bit. I said, what were you doing in Timisoara on the 10th of December? He said, well, I was there. I said, how many of you were there? He said, there were three task respondents. There was someone from Hungarian radio and two people from Tanjug. I said, you're all in Timisoara on the 10th in this little Transylvanian town over here? I said, yes. Romania now is a country where um, a great uh, uh, fiction is going on, and uh, it's true that uh, uh, a fiction can be, and the imagination can be um, a powerful and wonderful thing. The kind of fiction that now exists in that country is not a good one. It's an evil one in many ways, mainly uh, uh, that the government now ruling the country has been, um, is, is the result of a great staged play. More um, Romanian than that is the fact that uh, the uh, Bran Bran Brancus, actually is how Romanians say it, but Brancusi's uh, sculptures, especially the uh, magic bird, which I had uh, sort of unique and um, um, rare privilege of uh, viewing all by myself today somewhere in the recesses of this museum. Uh, it figures in the poetry of a great Romanian poet named Lucian Blaga, and I translated his poems uh, into English, uh, not because I believe in translation, because I don't, but because I had to pay a debt. He was the poet uh, of my adolescence. He's the poet forbidden when I was growing up who turned all of us into poets, the ones of us who were going to do that. and. Um, the way I obtained his book is by stealing it from a very nice old man who invited a few of us young poets to his house to eat his um, food. And so we repaid him by stealing all his books. <laughs> so I stole the first volume of Blaga's poetry and then not only that, but I miserably went ahead immediately because I needed some money to uh, drink and be a young poet. Uh, and sold it to Mihai Nadine, a professor uh, then in Cluj and told him that I would give him volume two and three whenever I would get a chance to steal those. And he paid me for the whole thing, so years pass, and I'm now in America, and I was at the Donnell Library in New York, the Romanian library there, and uh, there was a volume of Blaga in Romanian, and I stole that. <laughs> so it became imperative to translate this poet for all those reasons, and because I loved him. But uh, then I did dedicate this to, to Professor Nadine, who is now in the United States, and said, here is volume two and three, <laughs> okay? It's a sordid story. <laughs> the Magic Bird. High signed Orion blesses you in the sudden wind. A tear shedding above you its high and holy geometry. You lived once on a sea bottom and circled closely the solar fire. Your cries sounded from floating forests over the first waters. Are you a bird, a traveling bell, or a creature, an earless jug, perhaps? A golden song spinning above our fear of dead riddles. Living in the dark of tales, you play ghostly reed pipes to those who drink sleep from black subterranean puppies. The light in your green eyes is phosphorus peeled from old bones. Listening to wordless revelation, you are lost in flight in celestial grass. You guess profound mysteries under the hewn domes of your afternoons. Soar on endlessly, but do not reveal to us what you see. This business in the end about do not reveal to us what you see is a central fact of Blaga's poetry, who once said that our job when faced by a mystery is not to explain it, but to increase its mysteriousness. When I was trudging around uh, Transylvania and talking to Romanians and so on during the revolution, I thought I saw, and I wrote in an article in Grancha that I did about it, I thought I saw the shadow of an impending military regime, not a, not a junta. Not a, not a cabinet of generals, but a, a state where really the 
armed forces would hold the most power. Was I wrong in thinking that? Well, what we are seeing now is the emergence of a new type of military dictatorship in that part of the world, a new kind of military, because traditionally the military was never involved, but now they are running the country. They have an image problem. They can be seen as running the country, but there will come a point very soon, probably before this video comes out or anybody sees it, where the army will step in and they will say we're in charge because uh, there is a complete crisis of confidence in the government and everybody else is um, um, distressed. Demands of exile. We are growing a bitter seed issue of poets who can't go home again in this here jar of a mag. Here are squat, squat men in fat suits, papillon, greasy, huddled in dark Chicago basements, perched on writing tables to leap to Paris into Biedermeier inkstands. Prettiness, of course, isn't the issue when one has left behind all the pretty things and is now at the mercy of sense, happenstance, emigration, digestion. Nor is the issue courage or top form, though both are necessary in order to play sweep over the borders of official forms that need be completed and punctuated. Not nostalgia, not horror, not righteousness, though in various degrees these are the alarm clock perched on the wobbly armoire, child of one eternity and an enraged grown-up who saw her bathing one day at the non-political shore of childhood and caused them to merge into a murderous infinity whose issue is fiery death and more death. For now they are kept apart by the writing hand. The pen prevents the closing of the fist and prices being what they are, it's a good thing too. Not indignation, intelligence, rage, though in various bourgeois measure these two once mixed well to steer the hornet nest of culture causing bees to rise from pamphlets into larger print. Home is a car on the road to a cottage filled with storytelling, myth-making rustics leaning on a future composed of woven pelts, miles of sausages, milk, and approximate figures which form the anti-historical peak where one rests in the company of national fiction at its most formal ease under a sky of homespun ambiguities and goat. No, those are not the issues, though each line makes the jar buzz and sets the fashion free. The issue is ease and when. The bitterness thereof is the lack of it. The Sunday afternoon going to bad movies made by people one knows slightly, then letting the haze of a cigarette over Turkish coffee push the country forward, a miraculous machine that is the opposite of a cement truck. When I went back to Romania and saw my old friends from high school, then I definitely felt once more that I was a Jew, which I had quite forgotten in a certain way. My family came from um, uh, the part of Transylvania that was ceded to Hungary during World War II. And all of my mother's um, sisters and my grandmother's family died in Auschwitz. Uh, my mother and one of her sisters managed to get into Romania where they were safe. And so Hungary or the Hungarian parts of Romania to me is a desolate place. That's where all that side of the family was gone. There's a complete emptiness. There, there is nothing there. When I got to the other side, I found a kind of um, um, pedestrian anti-Semitism. It was in everybody's banal way of getting along. A guy came to our table and I was sitting with a friend in uh, Sibiu and he said, we exchanged a few words and he said, oh, you sound just like the kikes who are coming back. So I looked at him and I said, uh, and so who was your mother, Hitler's uh, assistant or dentist? I don't know what I said. He was offended. He was offended. He was, because this is just a way of talking. It was friendly to say, you talk like the kikes who came back. So I chased him away and for the rest of the time, my good friend kept exchanging soulful looks with his other friend who couldn't come to our table because I was going to